In the Digimon TCG, some decks and archetypes are absolutely spoiled for support. It probably doesn't warrant repeating, but you know, Greymon best deck. And then you have the outliers, or as I like to call them, the misfits. The decks and archetypes that maybe show a little bit of promise, but they don't have enough pieces or coherence to really come together and make a competitive deck. Well, BT11 Mirage Galgamon is one of those misfits. It's a confounding case to me because this card has two amazing effects, it's got two lines of support already with two more on the way, and yet its competitive results have been interesting to say the least. Now there is a way to make Mirage Galgamon work right now, but rather than just blurt it all out and have the video be 30 seconds long, I actually want to take some time and show you the process of how I went from just the card on its own to a finished and I think competitively viable deck. So that's what we'll be doing on today's episode of Some Assembly Required. All right, so let's actually take a look at BT11 Mirage Galgamon and see what all the fuss is about. So we've got two effects over here and both of them are fantastic. When Digivolving, you bounce an opponent's level five or lower Digimon to their hand, but if there's no target, you actually add the top card of their security to their hand instead. That's really cool. You basically bounce a medium-sized body or you burn them for a security. Fantastic. Then we have an all turns once per turn effect where it says when a effect adds a card to your opponent's hand, you gain one memory for every four cards in their hand. So obviously when you Digivolve up into the sky, whether you're bouncing a Digimon or bouncing a security, you get a little bit of memory back, basically making it a little cheaper since it is expensive at four. Uh, and then obviously since this is an all turns effect on your opponent's side, if they, let's say, swing with the draw one inheritable, they play down a searcher, maybe they add some cards back from the trash, you steal some memory from them, potentially ending their turn or more likely just cutting it short. Basically, BT11 Mirage Galgamon is just a huge floodgate, and it's a really interesting kind of floodgate. Instead of just saying, no, you don't get your memory effects or you don't get to play this or that, it says you can, but I'm going to punish you for it, and it punishes you arguably in the worst way possible, at least a floodgate like Madoki Betamon. Yeah, maybe you can't crack your memory boost, but you still have your three memory to work with. This guy says, hey, you just dropped a cool boy, you dropped a Davis, whatever the case is, I'm gonna steal that memory and make your turn even harder to play out. So this is a really fantastic card. It's pretty generic. It doesn't require Galmons in the sources or anything like that. So yeah, there's a lot of promise here. This is why I really love this card. It's super, super flexible and it promotes a very interesting style of control play. Now, do the two existing lines of support do anything for this? Uh, well, if we start looking at the, uh, the line out of BT4 over here, I, you can hear me laughing already because the answer is no, not really. So the line out of BT4 Great Legend, uh, it focused more on the kind of dead Digiburst mechanic, which basically lets you trash stuff from your sources to gain an effect. So for example, the level four says trash two of your sources and then draw a card. Doesn't really do much for this guy, does it? The so level five mock Galgamon here at least Digibursts two to bounce a level four or lower to the opponent's hand. So yeah, you know, uh, you're filling up their hand to make this guy gain more memory when you evolve up into him. Cool. And then yeah, you get a nice buff of 2000 DP if there's a tamer out, but really it's not doing much for you right now. And there are much better cards out of archetype available to you. The only card really out of the BT4 line of support that we'll continue to see play is Thomas Norstein, our dedicated tamer. So on play, Thomas will draw you one. And then the main effect is if the opponent has eight or more cards in hand, you can rest Thomas in order to unsuspend one of your Galmons. So obviously this is great. Uh, it allows you to swing swing with your big boss monster. And when we finally get Mirage Galgamon burst mode, this will allow you to go into him for cheap uh, and potentially swing more times than Melga could dream of. So it's a nice piece. Uh, it's fine to have now. The draw one certainly doesn't hurt. And yeah, it's really the only card out of the BT4 line of support that's gonna see any usage going forward. Now the stuff out of BT11 where we got this card is obviously a little better. Uh, Power Creep has done its job. So for example, we now have a dedicated searcher. You check the top three, you look for a Galgamon and you add a blue tamer. Cool, because it lets you add uh, either of these targets since they're not both uh, Thomas's. Oddly, you trash uh, the cards that you don't pick up, but hey, whatever. And then the Inheritable uh, says, if you have a Tamer in play, bounce a level three to the opponent's hand. So that's great. You're filling up the hand in order to make this guy a little bit more potent. The level four lets you attack. And if the opponent has eight or more in hand, you gain one memory. And yes, don't worry, there is a safe way to swing. 
And then this, of course, same effect as the uh, rookie inheritable bounce a level three to the opponent's hand, so cool. The level five is different. Uh, so instead of bouncing any cards, it basically makes this guy stickier. So when you digivolve into this mock Galgamon, you get blocker until the end of the opponent's turn. And for every four cards in their hand, you get a 2000 DP buff. So the idea really is just to bridge basically into your mega over here and make it difficult to remove by battle at least. Uh, and the cool thing is if you've already swung with the stack, let's say you swung in with a level four and you evolved into this guy, you can actually restand and make use of that blocker because this says when you add a, a card to the opponent's hand by effect, you unsuspend this Digimon. So, you know, if this is suspended, when you Digivolve into it, you go up into the Mirage, you add a Digimon or security to their hand, and then you restand and you're a big beefy blocker. Cool. But the really nice piece out of this lineup is uh, Nikolai, which is the dedicated tamer out of BT11. So start of your main phase, you give one of your main line jamming, which is great for the aggression, allows you to get some chip damage in early with the rookies, or of course, uh, swing early with your level four over here and hey, potentially bounce stuff if you have the uh, Galmon in the sources as well. And then the your turn effect, uh, when an effect adds a card to your opponent's hand, you rest this guy to gain one memory. So cool, you know, digivolving up into this alongside Nikolai, you can rest him and gain back even more memory or really control what the opponent is doing. So it's really nice. Uh, it is a shame <laughs> that it's not named Thomas Norstein, uh, but still, this is a fantastic card. And even going forward into BT13, it sees use at anywhere from two to three copies. Now, outside of the two tamers, however, I, I don't think there's too much going on here. There's not even necessarily enough for a fully fledged uh, Galgamon tribal. You can certainly put the two of these together just to have the names, but the deck is really not functional and it's only usable in the most friendly of formats. Uh, this stuff is definitely better. And I think at least the rookie over here and some of these pieces do provide you with some essential support going forward into BT13. Uh, this stuff, like I mentioned, almost gets abandoned completely. So we don't quite have enough really to make a viable competitive deck out of what exists over here. So that being the case, we need to start looking at some other options. Okay, so we've sat down with BT11 Mirage Galgamon. We understand how the card works and generally speaking, what it's trying to achieve. We've also looked at the existing lines of support, and we've got a pretty good idea of why those don't necessarily smush together to make a viable 50 card plus Digitama deck. So now that we see that there are some pretty sizable gaps that we need to fill, I think it's time to start looking at some engines and packages that'll help support Mirage Galgamon in its overall gameplay approach. And I think we have three really strong candidates that we can look at right now. All right, so like I mentioned, there are three engines that I think provide the strongest candidates for supporting Mirage Galgamon, and we'll go from, I guess, worst to best. Uh, so starting off sadly with the worst, we have the Leomon package. Now, I really liked this when I first picked it up because the Leomon package allows you to be super aggressive. It gives you recursion and with the inclusion of EX2 Leomon, you do have the ability to really extend your turns gain a little extra memory and set up your tamers, All right? Like generally speaking, the whole idea here is you get out your Leomons and then the X antibodies, when they're deleted by battle, they spawn a Leomon from the sources. So you get a recurring body over here. That's great. You can continue to aggro and then you can go up into Pongeamon, which allows you to spawn out a green or blue tamer for free. So obviously you can play out your Thomas, your Nikolai, or you can play a Davis as well if you have it. Uh, and again, you know, you go up into the X antibody and if it gets popped in battle, you just play out another Leomon. So I thought that was really cool. Uh, there's actually a build of this that I've seen that also teched in the Jellymon package to really allow you to bounce, like do some aggro, some cool stuff. But the issue I kept running into with the Leomon package is that you get stuck at your level five so easily because Pongeamon, while he evos from blue, he is not a dual color himself. He's green, so you cannot go up into Mirage Galgamon with your Pongeamon. You have to find the X antibody first in order to climb up that level. And uh, you'll remember that I mentioned if you are going to run the searcher over here, this trashes any targets that you can't pick up. So if you are really unlucky 
and you trash your Pongemon X antibodies, you basically get stuck and you never go up into Mirage Galgamon. And honestly, while this stuff is really cool, it's aggressive, you can take advantage of Jellymon maybe to bounce some lower level stuff, it just doesn't really feed into Mirage Galgamon style of play as well as I'd like it. And for that reason, I decided to put the Leomon package aside. Now, Blue Flare is actually a deck and an engine that I've used to play with Mirage Galgamon to decent, uh, decent results, actually. So I was running Mirage Galgamon as a tech two or three of, uh, as a top end to replace the Zeke Greymon. And for a while, it worked out really well, especially into the Crossheart matchup, because obviously you could bounce their stuff, waste their sources, uh, and it had some other niche applications as well to kind of control what they were doing. Blue Flare is cool, of course, because you can spawn out these very cheap level fives, you can stun the opponent's board, you can multi-swing, all that kind of fun stuff. Rush is really great as well. Uh, and hey, you have some really sticky bodies now, thanks to the addition of uh, some new armor forms like the Cyber Launcher. And of course, we have the Decker Greymon from back in the day as well. So this is really great. A lot of the pieces are really recursive because they have the save mechanic. You just tuck them under your tamers and then you can digicross out with them again. So cool, hey, we can cheat into a level five pretty quickly and then of course go into Mirage Galgamon and along the way freeze some of the opponent's stuff. I liked the control aspect. You could freeze their things. They would maybe try to dig for an out with a searcher and then obviously you could proc Mirage Galgamon's effect to cut their turn short a little bit. But more and more as I started playing these two together, I just found that Mirage Galgamon stopped being the go-to play. And the reason is that Mirage Galgamon, once he becomes the top of the stack, you kind of lose the appeal of the Blue Flare stuff, right? Because most of the Blue Flares, uh, the level fives at least, like the Metal Greymon, they will material save on deletion, or at least in the case of these guys, they have armor purge, so you go down into Metal Greymon, which then material saves, right? Which hopefully allows you to digicross into a fresh one. But if Mirage Galgamon is the top of that stack, he does not save, he doesn't material save nothing, so you lose everything, and then it makes it harder to re-establish your stacks on subsequent turns. Now, I also just found that you're kind of losing out on the armor purge, obviously, when you go on top of these cards with Mirage Galgamon, because, hey, Armor Purge lets you preserve the stack, and then maybe you go down into this guy who material saves. But again, if Mirage is on top and he gets blown up, that's it. <laughs> and for that reason, uh, it just it felt worse and worse the more I played with Mirage Galgamon as the top end to Blue Flare. And, you know, honestly, like the new Z Greymon more and more, I'm starting to like that card because you can be super aggressive with it. And as a level six, uh, it does allow you to restand and basically material save as well. Uh, so for those reasons, too, I kind of had to put Blue Flare aside uh, and just play the deck the way it's intended. Now, Blue Hybrid? I absolutely fell in love with this engine. And spoiler alert, this is the one that I picked uh, to really take Mirage Galgamon forward to competitive success. And uh, some other players did likewise recently at a couple of regionals. So, hey, uh, it ended up bearing out. Basically, the thing that's really cool about blue hybrids is, of course, you can take advantage of the fact that tamers are largely uninteractable. So you can basically have these level threes sitting out on the board that your opponent probably can't remove. You can get some really cheeky, sneaky swings in, of course, go into your hybrid, chip, chip, chip. Uh, but the card I think that really sold me on the package was Beowulfmon. This level five is so fantastic. So if you have a tamer in the source of your hybrids when you're digivolving up into him, he only costs one. That is a huge tempo swing because it allows you to get into Mirage Galgamon very quickly. And then of course the thing to really like about Bayo Wolfmon is the fact that he supports your win condition. You can attack with him and when attacking, you can bounce a hybrid from your sources to bounce an opposing level four or lower. So great, you can fill up their hand and then you can go into this guy and basically profit more off of the memory gain effect. I just thought that was really great. If you combine Beowulfmon with, let's say, the Kendo Gururumon, for example, you can very safely swing in, get that bounce, recycle this for another attack next turn, and still go up into your Mega, maybe getting something off of the board or just burning a security and basically doing two damage in one go. I just thought the synergy here was absolutely fantastic, and you have options. Uh, even Lobomon, who is basically a vanilla at that 5k DP, 
he sticks around when swinging into security more than he has any right to, which can put your opponent in quite a dilemma. And of course, it's always just a cheap two cost body that you can go into um, in the raising area as well. And hey, if you want it to be a little spicy, this Kendo Gurumon does bounce uh, level three Digimon when attacking as well. So hey, you fill up the hand. And again, you're just getting this guy to profit more from its all turns effect. And you know, obviously you can be really sneaky. You have a great control option with Tommy, allowing you to strip sources and freeze stuff. Kumamon and Kori Kakumon both allow you to stall out the game and uh, basically reduce the opponent's stacks as well. And combined with Beowulfmon, they are again, recyclable. So you always have access to your level fours. So yeah, I just, I thought this was a really fantastic engine. Uh, at the end of the day, I did end up leaning towards the kind of more Tommy hybrids just because the ability to freeze and source strip uh, allowed me to stay in the game a little bit longer. And it allowed me to deal with decks like Blue Flare and Crossheart way more efficiently than these guys would. You know, jamming is really cool, but when you're just swinging into tamers all the time anyways, it doesn't really come up and they're swinging into you as well, uh, which obviously uh, can mean that the games will be over really quickly. So ultimately, yeah, I, I decided to stick with a Tommy base for the uh, blue hybrids build and Beowulfmon really ended up being the key to my success here. The only complaint I really had about the blue hybrid engine is that you can kind of get stuck on your level five like you would with the Leomons because you can only play four of this Beowulfmon. Uh, there is another Beowulfmon and there is a level five for the Tommy line as well, but both of those do cost the full three to go up into and they don't really support your win conditions. So I just, I found they didn't really, they just didn't really work out. Uh, ditto for this guy actually, it, just, it was too expensive most of the time to go into. You couldn't go into this guy, swing, remove something and then go into Beowulfmon and there's some anti-synergy too because you can't swing with Beo if you've already swung with this guy. So yeah, that's what I ended up uh, building towards at Mirage Galgamon Blue Hybrids and we'll jump into the deck list momentarily so you can see how I kind of laid it out and really allowed this doggo to put in some work. And here's what I ended up throwing together. Mirage Galgamon meets Blue Hybrids. But generally speaking, the core of the deck is the tried and true Tommy Blue Hybrids base. So lots of Source Strip and Freezing thanks to Kumamon, Kori Kakumon, and Sora Joe. I think this is the right call since you can punish decks like Crossheart, Blue Flare, and Beelzemon, all of which like to play out small bodies and which suffer a bit from having their sources removed. I did decide to run a playset of Koji as well, because while the two cost mat or the mat Sora dual tamer did provide some easy memory gain, I found that Koji's ability to make things unblockable came up a lot against Crossheart and Mervamon decks. And you still gain memory off of him, which does make for some very efficient turns. Another decision here was to borrow the idea of a Leomon package from fellow YouTuber Los Numemons. Leomon provides a blocker in a pinch and kind of acts like a copy of Ice Wall on legs, especially when combined with the on deletion Gomamon to gain even more memory. You can also aggro with Leomon with very few drawbacks because if he dies, you gain a ton of memory, and if he lives, well, potentially that's another swing that you can put on board, and really at that point, your opponent has to deal with it. Aleomon also allows me to run the BT7 Strabimon, which tends to be absent from a lot of blue hybrid lists, and this is really great because the rookie allows you to play Koji on deletion as an inheritable. So if I don't happen to have a Gomamon on hand, I can just stick this under a Leomon and play out the Tamer for free when Leomon gets deleted, which believe me applies a ton of pressure on the opponent's side and makes them think twice about when they're going to swing in, as if Leomon potentially ending their turn wasn't already doing that. Option wise, I stuck with Hammer Spark and Howling Memory Boost because I just wanted to cut people's turn short or pass the turn while stunning something. In such a crazy fast meta, like the one we find ourselves in now, a lot of decks kind of ignore the memory system, so you have to be very careful about how much memory you're passing over or the manner in which you're passing turn with the little memory that you give them, and both of these do help with that math. 
between these options and Leomon, it basically became possible to play out a full turn, get all of the value off of my various pieces, and then slam down Sorajo or Davis without passing my opponent more than one or two memory at most. And that made all the difference in the world, believe me. And finally, Double Death Xmon also seemed like a must, since without Tommy at 4, it is a little harder to deal with massive stacks and wide boards effectively. This was backbreaking in the Crossheart matchup, and the big body insecurity did help at times against other decks. The general gameplay loop of the deck here is to control the opponent while setting up your tamers. You basically freeze things in place, clog up their hand, and then go into Mirage Galgamon for cheap thanks to Bale Wolfmon. From there, you just sit on Mirage and use the hybrids to rush down the opponent's security while your opponent struggles to establish a proper board. This all worked out really well, but as I did find out in testing, the deck does burn its resources fairly quickly. I had to cut the BT7 Kendo Gururumon a while back, and that made swinging with Bale Wolfmon a very risky prospect. And without that swing, or a single copy of Magna Gururumon in the deck, you do lose a lot more if the Mirage Galgamon stack gets dealt with. That said, it is overall a fantastic deck, it flows very well, it can be super aggressive, it can control, and it can have some absolutely absurd turns with the amount of memory that it can generate. And I really think that this is the best way to play Mirage Galgamon until it gets its full support in BT13. Now, I can't just come out and say that this is a fantastic deck without actually showing it in action, so with a little help from my pal Trubby Rubbish, I pitted Mirage Galgamon and its hybrid buddies against the best deck in the format, Crossheart. So Trubby Rubbish and I actually played a ton of test games against various builds of Crossheart, mostly because I wasn't settled on which blue hybrid lineup would actually do the trick, and I also wanted to see if the deck could take on the Mervamon variant of Crossheart as well. And to be honest, in those earlier games, I lost a lot. Like, a lot, a lot. Crossheart is a tough matchup to navigate at the best of times, and even with a couple Madoki Betamons in the earlier build, it was really hard to stop that all-in turn that Mervamon can do with all the memory gaining option cards and spamming out just a bazillion bodies to rush you for game. But eventually, the inclusion of Hammerspark of all things made the difference and converted things to a positive win ratio for the deck, in fact overwhelmingly so. The Cross 7 version of the deck, which Trubby is rocking in this game, provides a very different, but no less stressful challenge. Now, while I can pretty successfully deal with anything level 5 or below, a dealing with the big guy himself is a bit trickier, since I have no direct outs to a level 6. And Cross 7 has the ability to come down for just 2 memory, potentially less, if there are a couple of Zenjiros in play which makes it a very powerful and tempo-efficient play for Trubby to make. Luckily, the first time Trubby dropped a cross 7 on me, it was without its full materials. And while that did punish an early Mirage Galgamon stack that I had established, I was pretty quickly able to respond with Tommy and Howling Memory Boost to freeze the big guy in place. The bulk of the game actually went by with barely any security damage between us, which is kind of hilarious when you see the big cross 7 just chill in there on the board. And this was because I wanted to prioritize source stripping and bouncing his pieces so that it would just be too hard to get the full reduction on his later digi crosses. And once cross 7 got stuck on the board without its sources, it just ended up feeding into Sora Joe, which made my turns a little bit longer thanks to all the extra memory. I was also really cautious about swinging into his security, because if I was a little more reckless, it would spawn some tamers and potentially some bodies, and those could be used to chip into me and put me in lethal range way before I could adequately respond to the board he was building. Now, a very expensive Death Xmon did help me maintain pressure on his board, and while I couldn't quite get to that big, beautiful roster of tamers that Blue Hybris really likes, because Trubby also knew that just recklessly swinging into my security would spawn a bunch of them. You know, I was able to inch my way towards a winning position regardless. There was a brief scare when a Shoutmon Cross 4 came down because obviously it could just loop its materials, potentially go into a Cross 5 after that and blow me out. 
but thankfully at the time, Trubby was out of regular Shoutmons, so he had to slot in Omni Shoutmon under the Cross 4 instead, and thus the stack did not have a rush. I was able to pretty easily bounce the Cross 4, and while it did just immediately come back the next turn with its full materials, that was essentially the last bit of gas that he had in the tank at this point in the game. From there, a well-placed Leomon let me steal the turn when Cross 4 swung, and then I was able to go for the big game-winning push, thankfully skirting a Ballistamon that spawned out of security with the help of a double Kori Kagumon play. And in case anybody was wondering, yes, I did hybrid for game. Okay, so I think we've proved that Mirage Galgamon is in fact a fantastic card and that Blue Hybrids is the shell that it needs to really be competitive. And hey, if the Mirage Galgamon Blue Hybrids build is good enough to take on the best deck in the format, well, I think that's pretty promising, right? Also, kudos to Blue Hybrids for still kicking it after what? four or five main sets in a row. Uh, that is an absolutely ancient deck core that's still putting results out right now on the eve of BT12. And I think the cards have defied my expectations so much that they probably deserve their own deep dive a little later on on the channel here. As for the next episode of Some Assembly Required, I do have a few really good candidates in mind, but in particular, there is this often overlooked bug from BT8 I have a bit of a uh, frustrating personal history with this card as well, so maybe I'll find a way to actually make this guy put in a bit more work than he has historically. And on that note, guys, if you enjoyed the episode, please do leave a like, leave a comment, and subscribe if you haven't already. Your support helps to keep me going, and it's been absolutely fantastic for a channel that I just started, I think, like a month ago. So really, thank you to all of you for tuning in, and I hope I'll continue to entertain and educate over the next coming weeks. And on that note, guys, I will catch you all in the next one, and until then, peace.